everybody. My name is Julie Holland. I am a psychiatrist in New York City. Um, first of all, I really want to thank Deborah Kay for all your hard work and all your effort putting this event together. Um, it's big. It's impressive. So uh, a little bit about my story. Um, I grew up in the suburbs in the 70s. There were a lot of drugs around. I was very curious and interested in the brain. Um, I, uh, I did really well in school. I was a smart kid. I was somebody who was experimenting a lot with drugs, but I was also sort of taking notes and learning about my experiences. Uh, I ended up going to the University of Pennsylvania where I majored in something called the biological basis of behavior. So I was studying this sort of combination of uh, neurology and biology or biology and psychology, neuropsych, neurobio, biopsych. Um, but I, I had a concentration in psychopharmacology. I was learning about uh, the way that drugs affect behavior. Um, and while I was an undergrad, um, uh, in 1985, I learned about a new medicine that was being used by therapists and psychiatrists working with their patients. Uh, they were having really amazing results. I got very interested. I was a pre-med. I was pretty sure I was going to be a psychiatrist. So I was very interested in the idea that there was a new drug, first of all, which was fabulous. Uh, but also a drug that was being used in, in psychotherapy as a catalyst to make the therapy go deeper and faster. And this was the first time I really became aware of this idea of, of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Um, I ended up uh, meeting Rick Doblin and communicating with a lot of sort of elders um, in the space. I got in touch with Sasha Shulgin and Lester Grinspoon and George Greer. Uh, spent a lot of time just trying to learn what I could. Um, I ended up uh, editing a book about MDMA called Ecstasy, The Complete Guide. Um, and that is a nonprofit book where all the, uh, excuse me, all the proceeds um, fund clinical research. So um, I, uh, after Penn, I went to Temple Med School and then I went to Mount Sinai for my psychiatric residency. And during that time I did some schizophrenia research. Um, and I won an award from the National Institute of Mental Health that I'm very proud of. And then uh, I went on uh, for nine years, I ran the psychiatric emergency room at Bellevue Hospital. Um, and that was really a great finishing school for me. I got to see some pretty significant um, pathology. I got to see the effects of trauma firsthand and marginalized communities. Uh, it was a great job. I loved it there. I learned a lot. Uh, I wrote a book called Weekends at Bellevue that chronicled my time there. Um, and then I, I was starting a private practice uh, during the time I was at Bellevue, and I continued to, to uh, cultivate a private practice in New York City. But I, I ended up writing a book also about my private practice experience, mostly because what I saw was that a lot of people were being uh, over-medicated, over-diagnosed, over-pathologized, especially women. So I wrote, I wrote a book called Moody Bitches um, for women. And the, the idea there was to sort of uh, spotlight the, the inequality that was going on. And, and the subtitle of Moody Bitches is uh, the truth about the drugs you're taking, the sleep you're missing, the sex you're not having, and what's really making you crazy. Um, and the last chapter of Moody Bitches, the what's really making you crazy part, was where I first started to talk about this idea of disconnection that, and that the disconnection is what's making us feel depressed and anxious and the disconnection is what's driving uh, the compulsive self-soothing whether it is with alcohol or other drugs or food or shopping or social media but the, but for many of us uh, there is this unrest and unease and uh, a look toward something else or someone else to soothe us. Um, and my, uh, my contribution to this conversation was that I feel like the thing that is unsoothing us is the disconnection and that the more connected we are and the more connected we feel, the more soothed we are uh, and the better we feel. So um, the, my latest book is called Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. And what that book is really about is explaining connection, explaining uh, how it feels good, how it is good for us, how disconnection feels terrible and is bad for our bodies and our social skills. So in Good Chemistry, um, I explain about the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So everybody listening now, if anyone is listening, um, 
everybody's heard of fight or flight and the sympathetic nervous system. And, you know, the thing I always say is like from middle school to medical school, I must have been taught about fight or flight a dozen times easily. And it was always sort of sold to me as this is the key to survival. Um, you either attack or you flee, and this, this is how you survive. And I would say that that is true in a very small percentage of cases in our lives that we have to attack or run away. But the truth is, most of what we do the rest of the time um, is that we don't uh, charge forward or retreat, but we actually just stay. We stay where we are. We work through our differences. We collaborate. We cooperate. We communicate. These really are the building blocks for our survival. Um, and all of these things only happen when you're in the parasympathetic nervous system. So when you're in fight or flight, your social skills are terrible. You're not really open to integrating new information. Um, you know, if you're if there's a fire in your kitchen, you're not gonna you know Google how to put it out or get on the phone and chat with somebody and be social. You got a fire to put out. You're totally focused on that. That's all you're gonna do. You get sort of rigid in your thinking. So one of the reasons that I wrote Good Chemistry is because, believe it or not, before the novel coronavirus pandemic, we already had a couple of very big epidemics going on. And anybody who was involved in psychiatry could have told you a few years ago, oh yeah, we've got epidemics. There's an epidemic of uh, overdoses and there's an epidemic of loneliness, of isolation. And a lot of what is driving our numbers of increased suicide, increased depression, agitation, um, it all comes down to being isolated and, and being lonely and feeling disconnected. You know, uh, back in our days on the savanna, um, if, if you were sort of kicked out of the group, there was a very real chance that you were going to die. You would not survive, right? Uh, if the, the clan wouldn't necessarily share their food with you, um, or they wouldn't help you build a shelter, or they wouldn't help you mate and create a family, and you might get picked off from the herd because you were excluded from the herd. So ostracism and exclusion on a, on a very basic level um, feels a bit like death to us. We get very panicky and and uneasy if we feel like we're not fitting in the group. And if you look actually at what drives a lot of uh, addictive behaviors, social, displace and social displacement is a big part of that, right? You, um, for me, you know, my story that I wrote about in Good Chemistry was that um, I got kicked out of the in crowd when I was in eighth grade. And that kind of social displacement uh, it was terrible for me. I know it sounds sort of trite, but at the time it was a, a really traumatic event for me. And uh, that displacement, I think, helped to enable um, some, of, some of my more experimental drug use that happened uh, the year after when I was in high school. So we know that people who are socially isolated, socially displaced and marginalized uh, are more likely to feel depressed and anxious and more likely to soothe themselves with drugs. So I was curious about looking at, well, what makes us feel connected and how do we connect ourselves and how do we stay uh, with the good chemistry of connection? So the first thing I will say is that as long as you're in fight or flight, it's gonna be hard to connect. Uh, again, your social skills are very poor and you're not open to information. So all the connection really has to happen when you're in the parasympathetic nervous system. And as much as adrenaline and cortisol is sort of the juice that really runs the sympathetic nervous system, what really enables the parasympathetic is oxytocin. So oxytocin is a neurotransmitter and a hormone that helps us um, trust and bond and connect and be open. And it also, very importantly, enables neuroplasticity. So these states when we are open and we are learning new information um, end up being neuroplastic states. You know, learning is all about neuroplasticity. So what we're talking about here are making new connections between brain cells, right? So synaptogenesis means that you're making new synapses, new connections, but and neurogenesis means that you're actually making new brain cells. So um, Contrary to the, this is your brain on drugs, egg in a frying pan sort of messages from the 80s and 90s, what we now know is that a lot of these drugs that have been demonized and sort of stigmatized actually enable neuroplasticity. They enable a, a sort of a rewiring to occur and neuronal growth, um, new connections can be made. And with this neuroplasticity and rewiring and sort of recircuitry, uh, reevaluation of circuitry, um, this is really where you can get 
the behavioral change, the, the massive behavioral change that you can see from psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So um, uh, just to sort of <laughs> recap, right now, um, a lot of us are experiencing chronic stress, chronic trauma, chronic fear. Uh, some of us are afraid of being infected with a potentially lethal virus. Many of us are afraid for our, our democracy and what is happening uh, in our government, or we're afraid for our lives because of um, police violence and brutality and tremendous injustices that are happening all over in my country and probably where you're living also. So the thing I say about trauma is like, if you're not traumatized, you're not paying attention. There's a lot of things that are traumatizing right now. And this, uh, in the United States, you know, we're having, as many of you know, uh, a lot of us and them thinking and a lot of uh, disunion and dysfunction. You know, we're not, we're not feeling very united at the moment. And that creates a lot of unrest. Again, for these reasons, these very basic reasons that if you don't feel uh, part of a whole, you can feel more, uh, more in danger. So one of the things that I'm really interested in now and looking at a lot is, is this idea of cognitive rigidity versus cognitive fluidity. So cognitive rigidity is, you know, you're sort of thinking the same things and you're doing the same things and uh, there's not a lot of room for growth or change. So there are certain psychiatric diagnoses where you can see a lot of cognitive rigidity. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is one where, you know, you've got a certain ritual, you have to perform a certain way, and you're not going to be talked out of that. Um, addiction is another. You know, you keep going to a substance or a behavior because you think it is going to give you a particular feeling. Um, however, you get, you get other things that you weren't bargaining for that are maladaptive. Um, I think another good example of cognitive rigidity is anorexia nervosa, where you have somebody who is convinced that they need to lose weight, that they're not thin enough, but to any outside observer, they're like, you're plenty thin. So there's this rigidity in thinking and a belief system that can't be changed. So, and what we know is that with um, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, you can loosen up some of these rigid ways of thinking and some of these rigid ways of being, and you give people an opportunity to adopt other behaviors. So it's this combination of the quieting down of the default mode network, right? So this, this sort of uh, rumination circuitry of me and how am I doing and how did I do yesterday and how am I going to do tomorrow? And it's, it's very sort of self-serving, um, circuitry that's all about you. Um, and there are many psychedelics which will quiet down this sort of thinking and this sort of um, reverberative, ruminative, self-obsessed thinking. Quiet that down. And also psychedelics allow different parts of the brain to communicate, maybe different parts that don't typically get to communicate finally have a chance to communicate because there's different circuitry going on. So the end result of this quieting the default mode network and an enhanced connectivity with other parts of the brain really can enable um, new behaviors to form and new ways of thinking to form. And so this is one of the reasons why these medicines can be so transformative. Um, and again, I would remind you about oxytocin, that oxytocin enables this neuroplasticity, enables this learning, this rewiring, and it also helps to undergird these feelings uh, that we're connected, that we are open and bonded and trusting of something else. So with, with MDMA, we know that MDMA increases oxytocin, and we know that this increased trusting and bonding does two things, at least. Um, one is that it enhances the therapeutic alliance, right? The connection between uh, doctor and patient or therapist and client, this is enhanced. There's more trusting, um, you know, I trust you that you're trying to help me. Um, I feel good about you. I feel good about the therapy. These kinds of, of sort of side effects from an increased oxytocin can have a direct positive effect on the outcome of the psychotherapy. And then the other thing that happens with the oxytocin is that it quiets down the amygdala. There's less of a fear response, right? So that 
it's a little bit easier to actually examine the trauma, to look at these painful things that happened and figure out how they're informing our, our behavior. And sometimes you can really, you know, one of the things I like about, about psychedelic assisted therapy or MDMA assisted therapy is that it gives people a chance to sort of see the macro, to pull back and see the big picture. You know, and I liken it to if you're, if you're playing a video game, maybe you're stuck in the corner going around in circles and you don't realize it until you see the macro of the entire game and you realize that you're only in this corner and there's a whole other area of the game that you can explore. So it's a little bit like this with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy or MDMA assisted psychotherapy where you can get the big picture, figure out that you've been going around in circles, see your way out. You can maybe see the narrative. Um, one of the things that I like about, about MDMA assisted therapy in terms of oxytocin, and I think that Gould Dolan's lab, um, they published a, a paper in the journal Nature uh, in the spring of 2019. I was um, very happy to be uh, involved with a group of people at Esalen. We were giving a great conference at Esalen back when you could do these things in person. Uh, and Gould Dolan was just coming out with this information that, um, that MDMA allowed this, this oxytocin dependent reopening of a, of a critical learning period with MDMA. And, and the critical learning period was about social reward learning. So um, as we know, when you're an adolescent, you care a lot about what other people think about you. Um, you're very focused on social cues and you're focused on social reward. And it's a very particular time in brain development. And MDMA helps via oxytocin, helps to enable this sort of critical learning period. Um, and, and the brain is in a very neuroplastic state when there's increased oxytocin. Um, so it turns out that there are all sorts of plant medicines and consciousness expanding medicines that have an effect on oxytocin besides MDMA, um, including uh, psychedelics. So when you have this peak experience with psychedelics and you sort of get to this place where you feel like everything is connected uh, and everything makes sense, um, and you see the interdependence of things and you feel like you are part of it all and part of that connection. Um, that's a pretty heady experience. It's very pleasurable. Um, and it is sort of what I'm getting at when I talk about good chemistry in the book, good chemistry. So I just, I just want to say a couple quick things and then I will wrap up. Um, I consider psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to be a disruptive technology. Um, these consciousness medicines, these neuromodulators, psychotropics, you call them whatever you will, uh, as long as the words you're using are destigmatizing, um, these are efficacious, effective catalysts that can help psychotherapy go faster, go deeper, be more effective, and they can help catalyze great behavioral change. A few caveats. Uh, sustainability, I think we have to be very careful keeping an eye on, uh, for instance, how much peyote gets used or how much ingredients of, for the ayahuasca brew are getting used. We really have to be aware of sustainability issues. Um, access, marginalized communities, people of color, BIPOC people, um, LGBTQ plus question mark. There are people who are traumatized and people who really need this therapy. And unfortunately, they are not the people who are getting therapy at the moment. I think we all know that and it has to change and I'm hoping it will change. And then the last thing very quickly is ethics. Um, not just uh, the sort of capitalist ethics uh, of, of maybe not having anti-competitive practices, uh, but also more importantly perhaps is, is the ethics in the actual administration of the therapy to make sure that the therapists are not bad actors, that they have good boundaries, that there are not terrible transgressions. We've had a few over the years. Um, we can't afford to have any. So sustainability, access, ethics, disruptive technology, good chemistry, uh, go out and vote. God help our country and the planet. And if anybody has any questions, I will answer them in the next 50 seconds. And if you don't have any questions, then I will say thank you very much for having me. Hi, Julie. It's Deborah. Hi, Deb. Hi, Deb. Nice <laughs> thank job. You. Really nice job today. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. And thank you sure. for my copy that I'm reading. Wow. I, I mean, really, at the moment, I just want to take this moment to thank you. I recommend it to everybody.
good chemistry, um, the science of connection from soul to psychedelics, especially during the times we are living in at the moment. It's almost like you predicted this. Um, it's because funny. I was it worried is. it wouldn't. I was worried it wouldn't be timely, and it turned out to be very timely. So I was happy about that. I, I think what's happening now is that everyday people with not really big problems are now getting a tiny little dose of what many people in the world are suffering from constantly that we don't even know yeah. about because we're in our little houses not noticing and now we're getting a smidgen right of a taste um, and and I you know we're feeling it this book is, is very helpful um, and it makes you feel like okay yeah it's normal that I feel shitty at the moment because I'm really lonely and this is not what I want yeah, no, we're really, you know, we're built for cuddling and hugging and skin to skin and eye contact and smelling pheromones. We're not built for this kind of isolation. And it's very synthetic what we're getting from our phones and from our laptops. It's really not quite enough. Yeah, 100%. And thank you for all your work and thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was my <laughs> pleasure. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. I hope everything goes very smoothly. Smooth. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Thank you.